Um, there's a um, much more detailed paper referenced uh, to accompany this lecture, which you can pick up on the way out if you're in the hall, and will be up on the Gresham website in a couple of days uh, for those of you who are online. Now, um, we're all human, uh, but we're all very different. I mean, you just look around you to see how different we all are. And as we've come to learn more about our genetic makeup, we've begun to understand that some individuals and some groups of people not only get different diseases, but they respond differently to those diseases and to the treatment we give them. One treatment does not fit all, and that's the fundamental premise that underlies the concept of personalised medicine. Now, the way we currently treat people means that once we've made a diagnosis, um, we tend to give them the same treatment for all of the people in that group with the diagnosis. In some, it works. In some, it has no effect. And in some, it causes frank harm through side effects. The premise of personalised medicine rests on the proposition that by making some sort of diagnostic or more specific test, particularly a genetic test, we can identify subgroups of patients within that population so that from that test we can identify different groups of people for whom we can give a different and more specific treatment. The treatment that way would end up being targeted and more precise. Now there's all sorts of definitions, but this one works for me. And fundamentally, it's about classifying people into subpopulations which um, are susceptible, who are susceptible to a particular disease or responsive to a specific treatment, subdividing the population. And the story starts going right back to when genes were identified in the early 20th century through to the uh, description of DNA by Crick and Watson, to the sequencing, developing the order of the molecules within DNA, the Human Genome Project, uh, which was completed in 2003. And it was during that process, that whole process, that the concept of being able to identify subgroups of patients who might benefit from a specific treatment gradually evolved. The way your genes structure what's going to happen to you is in a way called the genotype. That's what your, the, your genetic makeup. And that codes for the phenotype. And the phenotype is, is everything about you which isn't your genes. It's the way you look, your functions, and how you behave. That's the phenotype. And we're beginning to understand that the genotype is influenced by the environment to modify the phenotype. Let's just talk briefly about the genome. Genetic information of you and I is stored in DNA in combinations of things called nucleotides, those molecules on the right-hand side, which are held in the spiral DNA molecule. The, the nucleotides are cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. And they combine in pairs. Adenine only pairs with thymine. Cytosine only pairs with guanine. And they form the rungs that go up this spiral staircase of DNA. And the scale of DNA and what they can encode these little letters is quite extraordinary. The human genome contains three billion base pairs. Um, uh, that's the base pairs of those um, nucleotide pairs in the middle of the molecule. One human gene is roughly 27,000 base pairs long. And uh, around 20,000 protein coding genes are included in the DNA molecule in humans. So there's quite a lot of bits of base pairs which don't make genes in between the genes. A newt has 15 million base pairs and a lily has 100 billion base pairs. Um, so the number of base pairs doesn't necessarily imply intelligence unless you know some very clever lilies. Uh, Wikipedia is sometimes very good at uh, summing things up, and I think their description of how this is all put together 
uh, is quite useful. The genome is like a cookbook with 2 times 23 chapters. The 2 times 23 refers to the chromosomes we have. We have 46 chromosomes in, in 23 pairs, and the DNA is crammed into those. Each chapter in that cookbook has somewhere between 48 and 250 million letters of these CTGA nucleotide sequences, and there are no spaces in between them, as you can perhaps see on the book. The book has 3.2 billion letters, and there are 20 different recipes, that's the genes that we talked about before, only making up 2% of those letters. And the whole book fits into a cell nucleus which is smaller than the size of a pinpoint, which is quite an extraordinary piece of packing. And we had to try in some way to untangle all of that um, coding that goes on inside DNA. Some of you may have heard on the radio today that um, you can use DNA, now being connected up essentially to a computer, in order to act as an alternative memory, and it's going to be much more efficient than conventional silicon memory. Anyway, in order to understand how all of these things are brought together, you had to sequence those rungs of the ladder and what those base pairs were and put them in some sort of order. And this was done by a process called DNA sequencing, um, which was quite labour-intensive in the old days and is now almost fully automated. And it's greatly accelerated the uh, research methodology, and biological and uh, discovery that can go with it. It's highly technical, increasingly automated and very competitive field. But the machines that do it look horribly like printers and um, not very exciting. Uh, but what they do certainly is. And what's very interesting was that the human genome project, which as you saw happened in the 1990s, cost $100 million to produce the first sequenced human genome. But since that time, the cost has fallen for you and I to have our genome sequenced to about $1,000. Uh, it's, it's quite an extraordinary reduction in cost. And it's gone down from taking years to do it just a few days. It's rather similar to Moore's law, looking at processor speed. Now, when it was $100 million to do this sort of stuff, it was much cheaper and quicker to search for things called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, because these are the most common type of genetic variation that are found amongst people. Each SNP represents a difference in a single DNA nucleotide. For example, a SNP might replace the nucleotide cytosine with the one thymine in a certain stretch of DNA. SNPs occur normally throughout your DNA, and they occur about every 300 nucleotides, which means there are about 10 million of them uh, in the human genome. And they mostly occur between genes where they can act as biological markers to help us split up the DNA molecule. Um, gathering together information about these various SNPs and comparing them with conventional databases happened quite quickly as researchers got together, set up international databases like the HapMap project uh, to compare an individual's uh, genomic data as SNPs with what they had available on other people. And this was then combined with the phenotype, particularly in the FIWAS database, which was managed in Nashville. But since the advent of uh, the ability to completely sequence the genome, uh, this may not be so necessary as it was. And so we can look at an accelerated process of personalized medicine. Now, as I said, our current medical model if you like, when we give drugs to people, is essentially based on trial and error. We give you a drug with your diagnosis and hope that it works, based on large trial data that have happened. Uh, but as Nicholas Shork published in a paper in Nature a couple of years ago, if you look at the top 10 highest grossing drugs in the United States, for every person that's helped, those are the little blue ones, um, the drugs fail to improve people in between 3 and 24 people. So in other words, if you give the drug 
to a group of people who should be, you would anticipate from the trial data, helped by the drug, it turns out that very few are. And that's because they are genetically different in some way. So wouldn't it make sense if you had a population of people that you could differentiate them in some way uh, so that you could identify by a test, perhaps a genetic test, those people who would respond, for example, to drug A so that you could give them drug A? If they didn't respond to drug A, perhaps you should give them drug B. And if they had terrible side effects from both those, perhaps you could give them drug C. So the test would allow you to differentiate between these groups of patients based on their genetic makeup. Now, um, th what we're really talking about is increased precision. And so the concept of personalized medicine has been around for a very long time in the sense that we, if you like the last talk I gave about bedside manner, medicine is, we hope, personalized. It's about you. But this is more about precision. It's about finding the right treatment for you or patients like you as best as possible. And Sir John Bell and the Academy of Medical Sciences prefer the term stratified medicine, but fundamentally the principles are all the same. You're looking for some sort of test which differentiates groups of patients into smaller groups to have more specific treatment. Um, precision medicine, um, as described by Vanya Lorak from Switzerland, requires these things. A precise diagnosis, the right drug, at the right dosage, at the right time, for the right patient, and at the right price. Not much to ask there. But as you've already gathered, if we're able or willing by these testing regimes to split diagnosis into smaller and smaller pieces, we have to find a new way of describing them, a new taxonomy for disease. And um, the way we classify diseases, they've classified them throughout history, of course. We knew that diseases existed. But the first major classification came from Jacques Bétillon, who was a French statistician in the 19th century, who, in about 1891 through 93, chaired a committee which uh, classified the causes of death in French hospitals uh, and, and used it as a classification for disease. This has been picked up and inherited by the WHO through the International Classification uh, of Diseases. And it's now on its 10th iteration. ICD-11 is coming out hopefully later this year. Now, um, these classifications change every 20 years or so because we find out more about what makes up disease, how to change its definition. So let's look, first of all, at diabetes is a simple example. If you look at ICD-9 on the left here, um, you'll find that um, in the middle is a one that says diabetes mellitus, 250, and it's got two parts, diabetes type 1 and type 2, which you've probably heard of. There's diabetes type 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, um, diabetes type 1 includes a couple of other things, maturity onset diabetes of the young, neonatal diabetes mellitus, it got latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. And if you look even more carefully, we now know that these can be split up based on the genotype, the genetic makeup of people with type 1 diabetes. So if you look at these, which all those modis refer to maturity onset diabetes in the young, you can see an enormous number of individual genotypes, that's the OMIM, online Mendelian inheritance in man database, coding for certain genes and proteins which are involved in the metabolic pathways of diabetes. What was a simple diagnosis in ICD-9, diabetes, is now a much more granular, a much more detailed, and an utterly different table, because they may all need different treatments. That's the uh, online Mendelian's <laughs> Inheritance in Man catalogue. And it's not just the genotype which is getting more granular. Just this month, a large um, data set of patients in Scandinavia was reported, um, which looked at the phenotype for patients with diabetes, how they presented. And they identified 
a whole series of clusters, five clusters of diabetes which present and behave in different ways, get different complications. And they argued that not only did you have to consider the genotype, but also the phenotype of these patients in order to get much more precision. So we've gone from diabetes mellitus in the 1970s and 80s to something which is infinitely more complicated in order to be much more precise to identify those patients who need a specific treatment. And um, this is important because, for example, of some of the work uh, reported by Thomas in Exeter, they took data from a UK biobank looking at patients with a genetic susceptibility to type 1 diabetes, overlapping on the top graph people with a genetic susceptibility to type 2 diabetes. And the most important part about this was that they identified that there was a subgroup of patients, which was not small, who didn't present in the first three decades of life, the first 30 years when type 1 diabetes is supposed to present, but were actually presenting with type 1 diabetes after the age of 30, overlapping with type 2 diabetes. In other words, if you didn't know that this subpopulation existed, hadn't been able to identify it, you would make a misdiagnosis of type 2 diabetes and um, not give them the correct treatment. This is quite an interesting uh, a relationship between phenotype and genotype, which has direct impact on a simple disease. Now, um, I wanted to emphasize the complexity because putting all of this stuff together is quite hard. You've got a growing number of subdivisions of diagnosis and a growing subdivisions of both genotype and phenotype. And um, a variety of international organizations, such as the uh, um, National Academies in the US, is just one example, have built structures which they call knowledge networks to pull all this together in order to identify and reclassify all these taxonomies. Because we've got to find some means of talking to each other about these ever more complex diagnoses. You are probably more familiar with the use of uh, genetic coding to guide treatment in cancer. It's got quite a lot of, of coverage in the paper. For example, a particular genetic abnormality in chronic myeloid leukemia means that if you've got it and you're treated with a particular drug, you can double survival rates. If you've got a certain type of colon cancer and if this particular uh, EGFR gene is um, abnormal, then you can improve survival with another monoclonal antibody. So the genetics in this context of cancer can alter survival rates. You may be more familiar with these two genes, the BRCA, BRCA genes, BRCA type 1 and 2. These are extremely important in the context of breast and ovarian cancer. Abnormalities in these genes result in either a failure of production of specific repair proteins or a malfunction of those proteins. And unfortunately, they can be inherited, passed down through generations. Um, and that transfer of a mutation is, is understood, and it's resulted in quite a few people, not least thanks to Angelina Jolie, um, people opting for bilateral mastectomy to reduce the risk of breast cancer, which they can predict they're going to have from their underlying genetics and a strong family history. Unfortunately, there are now 500 mutations of the BRCA1 gene which have since been identified, and that just further emphasizes the complexity of this sub-diagnosis problem that we're talking to, and there may be even more specific treatments uh, that are appropriate. Another one in my field <clears throat> is um, in hypercholesterolemia. Hypercholesterolemia, as you, as you know, will predisposed to coronary artery disease and stroke. And so it would be useful if you could find a way of reducing the um, high cholesterol. And a few patients were identified who had a very low LDL level in their blood, uh, which uh, without having changed their lifestyle, which is in inherently a protective state of play for the amount of cholesterol in your circulation. These individuals had a loss of function of a particular gene, and that particular gene was involved in um, stopping 
too much LDL getting into liver cells or stopping liver, getting LDL into liver cells. And by developing monoclonal antibodies to that protein, um, they were able to increase the uptake of LDL by liver cells and reduce the level in the blood, which made it suitable for treating people who had statin-resistant hypercholesterolemia. So the genetic change, genetic identified gene, proved to be a means by which you could get to grips with a group of patients who otherwise would not have been treatable by understanding the detailed mechanism of the disease. Now, this is really important because it means that if you can identify rare disease, small groups of patients, black swans, and you can use those to uh, find the genetic abnormality which is associated with small changes in the metabolic pathways with disease, then you can get to grips with understanding that mechanism and that will open the door to new treatments. And unsurprisingly, industry and academia are really hot now on studying rare disease uh, to look for black swans. And to do that and to monitor the disease and to make these tests work, we have to use biomarkers. And these are, as, as you can see the definition, it's a way of monitoring what's going on with a particular patient or identifying subgroups of patients. We talked about using some sort of diagnostic genetic test, a form of biomarker, but once you have your patients identified, you need to be able to follow them up to see if your treatment's working. And we can do that by using various biomarkers. You, you'll understand using blood sugar or hemoglobin A1, for example, for diabetics, or creatinine for people in renal failure. And now people are looking for circulating DNA of specific tumours in, in different types of cancer. So these allow you, by measuring them in a particular patient, you can use imaging as well, to monitor the course of a disease over time. We now present ourselves with a really big problem in personalised medicine, precision medicine. And that is that we have just created shed loads of data. Knowing about the genome is roughly 20 gigabits of information. It's about the same for a proper description of the phenotype of a patient. And then if you add to that changes of biomarkers over time, over the course of a disease, you can see that you can accumulate a really quite extraordinary amount of information, amount of pure data um, for a single patient. Um, there's no way we can handle this without the techniques of modern computing, and there's no way we can handle it into the future without using big data analytics uh, that you have read about in the papers. There are huge challenges which arise simply because of the scale of the data collection management um, that we need. The first of these is that it's all coming from different systems. Um, you're collecting it from gene machines and from um, MRI machines and from blood test machines. You're putting it into a database, electronic patient records and so on. And all of those are different. And uh, to make it all work, we have to share it in order that we can understand how they interrelate together. And, and you'd think um, that the NHS would be the most perfect model for this. We have a nation state with a fully integrated healthcare system with primary and secondary health care, and um, all our labs are linked up in some way. Well, it turns out we're not really good at linking it up. Um, we haven't done well in buying a uniform technology. It is not yet interoperable, even between primary and secondary care. And we have major problems with data security and therefore with public trust. Just last year, you might have read that there was the potential loss of 26 million primary care records from a particular GP system, 26 million records. On a smaller scale, 800 patients with HIV, their data was lost, leaked from a particular clinic. You might remember the WannaCry and Petya ransomware attacks on the health service last year. And um, Perhaps more relevant to this talk is something that happened at the Royal Free. Um, the Royal Free sort of went into bed with Google's DeepMind, which is their big data analytics module within the Google company to look at healthcare. It's a very sophisticated 
uh, team. What they wanted to do was to capture all the information in the hospital systems and identify um, trends and um, patterns. And they particularly were interested in early detection of renal failure because if you can sort it out early, uh, patients uh, wouldn't die and wouldn't need dialysis and you could uh, reduce the whole complication rate. And it worked. It was very successful. So DeepMind looked at all their data and identified patients who were going into renal failure. The problem was that the people who were giving their data to the hospital system, the patients, uh, didn't fully realise that they were also giving it to Google. And the information commissioner didn't feel that this was a particularly correct thing to do. And no matter how successful the innovation was, she was really worried that your fundamental rights as an individual were broken. Now, I have some sympathy with that view, but just to put a counter one is that in all the years I've been working with databases in the NHS, I have yet to find a single patient who will refuse to give their data to that patient if it's properly, to that database, if it's properly explained to them and provided that we can guarantee their security. I had thought that was a straightforward thing to do to guarantee the security, but I'm learning that it is not. I want to use as an example um, something called biobanks. Biobanks are organised collections of biological material, which could include tissue or blood samples, um, and all the data that goes with it. Now, unfortunately, they grew up from interested parties, and they grew up in a rather haphazard way, with varying aims, varying governance, varying ownership, and various management structures. Um, but if you think about it, the need for some sort of privacy, rigorous privacy, is very evident. And this was beautifully demonstrated in Iceland. Iceland's a really attractive area for geneticists because it's a small enclosed island and the gene pool, if you like, is, is tight. They set up in 1998 um, a health sector database, a biobank of, of all the tissue that they collected in Iceland and licensed it to a private company called Decode. Now, that immediately sparked a lot of controversy. Why are we in bed with a private sector company? What are they going to do with our data? But actually, only 10% of the Icelandic population at the time made a lot of noise about it. And it reflects the anxieties about much of this work because a lot of the scientific progress, because of the investment required, has taken place in the private sector. Now, this starts to get a bit more complicated because Decode, two or three years ago, was taken over by Amgen, which is a massive, multi-billion dollar American um, biotech company. Now, that creates, not only for the Icelandic population, but for many of us, um, huge anxieties about the ownership of the data and of data protection. Why is the biobank data from Iceland valuable to them? it's because of the black swan argument. Because in that tight gene population, they're more likely to identify subsets of rare diseases, rare gene types that would allow them to get to grips with some of the products that they want to market. In this country, um, you will probably, I'm sorry, I've jumped ahead. In this country, we have, um, the, our Prime Minister, David Cameron, in 2012, announced the setting up of the 100,000 Genome Project, which is a much more explicit relationship between the public and private sector through academia, to decode the genome in rare diseases, particularly, and in cancer. Again, looking for these black swans. 13 genomic centres have been set up across the country, and people had to compete to take part in it. My own hospital was one of those who competed. Now, better media handling has made this particular public-private partnership less controversial. And I think the potential benefits of understanding this, I hope, have already become clear to you. But there are problems. We've all got rather used to the erosion of our, our private space with regard to data. Um, most of us, certainly I do, freely tick the terms and conditions box when upgrades to our software appear on the screen. Um, the IT companies present us with these and 
usually we tick agree without reading it all the way through because we want what the software offers and we don't want to bother with all the legalese. At least perhaps I'm alone in this, but I'm not sure I am. But very often buried within the terms and conditions are statements describing what the company can do with your personal data. And if you think how data are collected from us, you don't have to conceive very far to recognise that this is a problem uh, which is massive. So we're quite comfortable with giving our fingerprints. You can't do get into the United States without giving your fingerprints away. Um, social media collects a huge amount of information. I understand that five clicks, five likes on Facebook give you a very strong indication of how you will vote at the next election. And um, the location services on our cell phones uh, identify where we are. And of course, there's closed circuit television everywhere. Just scanning all of this stuff, this is data about us in the public domain very often. We don't really notice it. But our medical data is different, I think, and our genetic information even more so. We've all got familiar with the idea of identity theft in relation to banking um, and how we trade in money. But what better indication of your identity than your genome? What is your identity other than your genome? And I particularly am not very comfortable about the idea of someone in Russia hacking into my genome and changing the sequences of CGAT, nor for some kid in a bedroom who's bored doing the same thing. But they're possible. The data that we generate in these systems are obviously inherently valuable to all of us if we can protect it, but we have to make sure that that value is not lost because of breaches of trust. So, how do we study these therapies in smaller and smaller populations of patients? Now, um, typically, research in the drug world has been done by large population-based randomised controlled trials, drug A versus a placebo. And you select the patients who go into trial, you calculate the large number of patients that you need to see a difference, and you exclude a whole bunch of people who don't quite fit in. But very often on those trials, you end up with disappointing results because um, some people, as we've said earlier, don't respond to the therapy. And some people in the placebo group aren't getting a drug which might help them. And that means that there are endless modifications to trial or restudies or post hoc analysis in order to identify those subsets of patients. Now, if you can identify smaller and smaller patients in whom it is very likely that a treatment will work, the trial design concept is threatened. The randomised trial on that scale doesn't look so attractive. And various models have been thought of that have got nice names like umbrella trials, basket trials, N of 1 trials. And I haven't got time to explain them, but in, in some principle, let's imagine it this way. Let's say you can identify a subset of patients with a particular genotype, and there might be four drug options developed to treat it. Um, why would you compare those with a placebo if you know that you're focused on a particular disease? Why not try these four drugs on that individual in sequence and monitor the effectiveness of those agents using biomarkers at regular and fixed intervals and gaps between the treatment. It, it, it's not intuitive if you're used to a randomised trial, but increasingly this is being discussed as an option. Of course, it's very attractive to patients' groups because if you're um, likely in a sequence of treatments like this to get the treatment that works for you, that's better than ending up in the placebo group for five years and not getting any treatment at all. Uh, I think this is just a, an environment where we'll have to watch this space. Trial design in this environment is complicated uh, and um, we'll just have to see where it goes. Now, um, to go back to this point about what personalised medicine is, Nicholas Rose defined it quite clearly in terms of probability. The fact that the genomic information about uh, a group of people can split it into groups with different probabilities – 
that they will respond to different types of medication, different probabilities that they will get an adverse reaction. One group high, one group low, but in neither group is there complete certainty because there's always something we don't know, maybe that environmental factor. But is there treatment that we can give that really is specific, really is personalised, suitable for one person? And I just want to give you one example of that, which is the idea of using um, uh, this technique of chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy in which you modify the patient's own cells. I'll just um, dr blow up this diagram to show you. The idea of this is that you take the patient's lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, killer lymphocytes, out, and then you modify them with a virus um, so that they can be changed to target a tumor cell and bind to the antigen on the outside of the tumor cell and destroy that cell. So you, you get the cells outside the body, you modify them with a virus, you s change the way they will bind to the receptor specifically for that cancer cell and then put them back into the patient. So they're the patient's own cells cycling back into the patient as living drugs, if you like. They're the patient's own cells, specific for them. It truly is personalised. This is uh, an interesting treatment. It's quite intensive. It needs either isolated care, high dependency or ICU. There are significant side effects in some patients. Some of them have been fatal and it's expensive. Now just to put that in context, that's no more expensive than the first heart transplants or um, the first artificial heart machines. This is the cost of innovation, which will gradually come down, of course. But it is complex, it is expensive, and it is risky. And if you think of it in terms of drug industry or pharmaceutical industry, it has huge supply chain problems in order to make this work effectively and efficiently across the system. So can we afford precision medicine? Um, well, let's consider that. There are some potential savings if it works out. The first is we're likely from those initial biological tests to get more accurate diagnosis with fewer patients per treatment group. You're not going to waste drugs on those people who aren't going to respond to that treatment because you'll have identified that they're not going to benefit from it. You'll avoid expensive and predictable side effects. And hopefully, because you've been more specific, the outcomes will be better, and so you'll have less burden of disease on the community and less on costs for the, both the family and society. But there are costs too. The cost of the tests is not to be sneezed at. And especially if that moves from testing small groups of patients into whole populations, that is always expensive. The IT, which we've hinted at, is complex and complicated and will require system change. And not least, keeping it safe is going to become more and more expensive as uh, the size of the data improves, the complexity of the cloud increases, and we're subject to more and more attacks from um, bad actors. And then there's the whole business of how much it costs to make a drug and how the company is going to price it so that the payers, the government, you and I, have to work out whether we're willing to pay that price. Um, and diagnostics, the diagnostic tests, as Raj Chopra from the Institute of Cancer Research pointed out, are not a money spinner for the industry. In fact, industry would largely rather have a very cheap diagnostic test and a very expensive drug to market um, because they can make a, a significant margin on that. It's not really surprising when you consider that in 2014, the cost of getting a single new prescription drug to market was roughly 1.87 billion dollars, pounds. 1.87 billion pounds to get a new prescription drug to market. Now, a significant proportion of that cost um, comes from clinical trials and the regulation, but only 30% of it comes from the pre-human stage. 
the cost of drug development has multiplied tenfold since the 1970s. And there's still only a 7% approval rate on average over those 12 years. So there's an awful lot of stuff going on in the background that never gets to market, and yet the costs have risen hugely. Four-fifths of drugs are discontinued during development. And these become something called orphan drugs. Drugs that are not developed by the companies for economic reasons and sit on a shelf, even though they might conceivably respond to a public health need. You could also have a drug called an orphan drug if it's used for treating a common disease and then actually it might be useful for a rare disease. There's a chap called Derek Lowe who's christened something called E-Room's Law, which is the reverse of Moore's Law. Um, and he termed this um, uh, as the cost, the cost of developing a new drug doubles every nine years. The left-hand axis here is the number of drugs developed per billion US dollars. So you're getting less drugs for your investment over time. The cost of developing a new drug doubles roughly every nine years. Now, that's really important because if we're thinking of personalised medicine, we're not thinking about a drug that treats all of you, but a drug that treats some of you. And if it costs the same to make all of these drugs each time, that becomes economically challenging. It's a market problem. There are enormous development costs, expensive testing to differentiate those of you who will respond and those of you who won't, and it's going to cost a shed loads of money to keep all the information safe. And the market is tiny because we've split you into a tiny group of people. That makes it quite challenging from a business perspective. Well, wouldn't it be nice if we could reduce the development costs? And to some extent, you can. You can't really take away the biological costs, but you could reduce the costs of the way we investigate it at the clinical end, at the trial end perhaps by using better biometric testing to focus our testing on smaller groups of patients, as I indicated earlier, different trial designs, and maybe the regulation needs to be modified. At the moment, you can't get a trial, a drug to market very easily unless you've done a major randomised control trial with a population versus a placebo. Manufacturers are likely to seek to maximise their return um, perhaps by selling the market test, the, the test and the drug together. So they're not just selling the drug, but maybe the biometric test as well. And that would be quite appealing if they're going to market the old drugs that they've got sitting on the shelf. If they can redo that, for example, with a new test, then they may be able to extend the duration of the patent and return, they get their return on investment over a longer period of time test and drug become synergistic. And then we have this huge market problem which relates to IT and regulation costs. And this requires uh, that classic political statement, we have to simplify regulation, which we all seem to struggle to be able to do. But actually, in this market, if it's going to work, something has to be done to re-understand how we would regulate it which brings me on to ethics. Um, just a few decades, we just a few decades have gone from sorting out DNA. 30 years the internet's been around, 14 years from the first sequencing of the genome. And the science has progressed at a massive rate. But um, that progress has often been made before we realize the ethical and social implications of what we're doing, as is often the case. Let's just use bio banks as an example to, to raise some of these ethical questions. For example, if we put my blood sample or your blood sample into one of these banks, what use is it going to be put to? Did I ask you if it could go in there and what, what I was going to do with it? What are the secondary uses? Can I sell it on to Amgen or somebody else? And um, what are the terms and conditions of that contract when it is sold on? Do I need to reconsent you if I do want to do those things? And if so, how do I find you if you've moved? If you change your mind, can, we can you have your sample destroyed? And who has the authority to destroy it? 
And what information, how much do I have to feed back to you from time to time during the process of this? If I testing any of those samples turns up something that you, ha you turn out from this biological sample you've left with me, we do some tests on it, and it turns out that you've got a, a disease which we didn't think of at the time, do I have a duty of candor to tell you about it? If I identify something which could, like those BRCA genes, be inherited in your family, do I have to tell your family? Should that be in the terms and conditions? And if the data are lost, stolen, hacked, or otherwise moved on, what rights do you have under those circumstances? And if that biobank data crosses international boundaries, who's regulating this? America, Russia, France, Germany, EU, England? Who's in charge? Who owns the data becomes a key question. And it's really important because in the 1990s, a company called Myriad patented some tests associated with the BRCA genes and actually patented or tried to patent the DNA sequences of the BRCA genes themselves. The DNA in the gene sequence, a biological gene. Um, they marketed the test for over $4,000. This is in the 90s, so it's really expensive. And there was massive public opposition. And the American Civil Liberties Union took them to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, in a historic judgment, said, you basically can't patent human DNA. They're not patentable. And that fitted in with something called the Universal Declaration of Human Genome and Human Rights, which declares that the genome is the heritage of humanity. And it, in its natural state, it should not give rise to financial gain. But the Supreme Court left a little window open for products of that DNA to be patented because they did not want to suppress, quotes, incentives for important biomedical innovation. There is still the potential to patent some of these processes. Now, optimists may appreciate the dream of Desmond Tutu, who donated his own cells for a study on genetic diversity. This is what he said. My dream is that by including peoples in understanding and reading the genetic code, we will realize that all of us belong in one big global family, that we're all brothers and sisters. Wow. Now, he's an amazing, inspirational, inherently optimistic man with a real belief in the inner goodness of his fellow men. But history sadly demonstrates that some humans wish to create divisions between peoples and even destroy those they think different, inferior, or simply irritating. We know about Hitler and the Jews, the Hutus and the Tutsis, the Na uh, Native Americans, and most recently and tragically, the uh, Rohingya people from uh, Myanmar. Just imagine how a modern day Hitler might behave when armed with the information tools of a state, acquiring the extensive or having access to the extensive database containing the genomic information about you all, he raises the question, find me all the people with X. Or why? It's not science fiction. Erdogan has just uh, published the genomic information about a large, massive Turkish study. And there are obviously people worry about whether this is related to Kurdistan or to what happened with the Armenians in 1915. Finally, I want to discuss access to treatment. The focus of all of this activity in personalised medicine has been on diseases of affluence, if you like, cancer and rare disease, and not on those things that affect the rest of the planet. Um, there's this incredibly moving paper published this week from Bosnia, which describes the frustration of a reasonably close to us place, knowing uh, that you have new and effective treatments available, that you have and have identified the patients who would benefit them, but you have then neither the access to the biological tests nor the drugs to deliver those patients which are available in, say, the rest of Europe or North America. They describe a clear mismatch between scientific knowledge, political will, 
and political knowledge. The current prices of these agents are set in markets for the affluent and privileged. Once again, as we've talked about many times in these lectures, there is this disparity of wealth which repeatedly is influencing the way in which we can deliver healthcare across the world. A common, three, common theme running through much of this is distrust of big pharma, the large pharmaceutical industry. There isn't space to explain how that's arisen. But what matters is that we have to trust each other if we're going to deliver particularly the advances in personalised medicine. And because of the sensitivity of the data involved, the political and potential social implications, then trust is going to be a key element in this development. Now, in common with much of medicine, the more you discover, the more you extend the need for discovery. I mentioned earlier that the environment can play a role in influencing the course of a disease. And this has been re reconfirmed this week by workers in Quebec who've highlighted the influence of air pollution, amongst other things, by manipulating the genome, changing the diseases that they're going to get. This is really important. It's important not just because of the science, but because of the massive increase in data that this creates as we talk about managing personalised medicine. Their findings demonstrate that the genotype and the phenotype change. Now, I'm an in inherently optimistic person, I think, about most things anyway, and um, I believe that personalised medicine has a huge amount to offer as an exciting innovation for the future. But there remain huge problems with access and equity. The third world, if we can call it that, suffers from a shortage of water, suffers from a shortage of food, suffers from a, a variety of political problems, including war. And until we can resolve those, we're not going to see enormous advantages. The Gates Foundation slightly disagrees, and it says that the impact of personalization, well, personalized medicine will have a big impact on, for example, the treatment of malaria or trypanosomiasis. We have to resolve the problems of privacy and data security, because this is a massive amount of data and it is fundamentally about our identity as individuals. We don't know how the market is going to work in personalised medicine. It's in a state of flux. It's a very difficult thing to understand how big companies are going to be able to continue on the business models they've had in the past. They aren't going to find blockbuster drugs anymore that are relevant. We have to do new testing. People have suggested maybe we should not look so much at profit but consider it rather like a bus company. Bus companies are paid to run empty buses um, so that the route is sustained. Uh, it's common in London through the um, Oyster Card and so on. But perhaps states and private sector need to work out how to cross subsidy in order to get the maximum out of all of this and to share the data. And of course, None of it is going to work unless we can maintain ethical and regulatory control over the whole thing. The problem is, when we have a little bit of a face-off between someone who wants protectionism on the one side and someone, for example, who wants to pry into other people's data, perhaps, on the other side, the internationalism and the sharing of data on which this demands is really challenged. And from protectionism, there's a huge challenge to what we understand by the term market. And I think uh, I worry a great deal about the transfer of data into individual companies like Amgen, for example, as a core principle of whether this should be uh, controlled in a different way. I'm old enough to remember a wonderful book called 1066 and All That, which was a, a brief guide to British history. And in that book, uh, there were 103 good things and five bad kings. I think precision medicine is dominantly a good thing, certainly more than the few bad actors who can screw it up. And I would hope that you'll agree with me that this is the right direction for medicine to go in. It is going to be a very exciting time. 
but we need to keep our eyes and ears open that it is properly controlled. Thank you very much. Um, this has been a, a tough topic for me because it didn't exist when I was at medical school, so I've had to learn quite a lot. And I, lo I have a lot of people to thank. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for being here and for turning up uh, tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>